in the book of Job chapter 2, 1 through 10, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, for there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil? And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your power. Only spare his life. <clears throat> then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Father God, as we pause this evening once again to look at the book of Job, I pray that as we make our journey through these many chapters, O oh God, that we will be able to take life lessons and life applications that you want us to know, that you intend for us to understand. The things, Father, that we cannot answer, the things that we surmise about, O oh God, are only surmising in our mind for we realize there are many things that we were never intended to fully comprehend or understand this side of eternity so help us father that we would apply our hearts unto wisdom as we journey through this book in Christ's name we pray amen now tonight I want to try to get through these notes and next uh, Wednesday evening I want to finish chapter 10. Thereafter we will move quickly through the book of Job taking a chapter at a time. But if you can only imagine, can you even begin to fathom in your mind tonight that your name might be connected to such an agreement that would be out there? You know basically God says basically all right Lucifer you can go after Job just don't kill him. But God set boundaries. God said, preserve his life. But in other words, Job would be fair game to Satan, as stunned as those words seem. Whenever you and I remember the days of the uh, World Trade Center, the days of the Pentagon, and all that transpired on that day, and the shock that overtook America, you can only imagine the shock. You can only imagine what transpired between Job and his wife. You know, God knows what Satan thinks. Satan cannot know what God thinks. But God certainly knows what Satan thinks. God knew what Job thought. God knew the heart of Job. God knew that Job's faith will still be intact when we get to the end of this book. In verse 7 of our text for this evening, the suffering intensifies sore boils all over Job's body. Satan wasted no time in trying to knock Job out. And um, skin ulcers that were all over his body, you can only imagine the unbearableness of the pain that he went to. When you carefully examine each chapter here in the book of Job and you see the references to his symptoms that accompanied this skin disease, there's a summary of what Job suffered. In fact, just listen. In Job chapter 2, verse 7, they're inflamed, they're ulcerous sores. In Job 2, 8, persistent itching. In Job 2.12, degenerative changes in his facial skin and disfiguration. 
In Job 3, 24, there's a loss of appetite. In Job 3, 25, there's fears and depression. In Job 7, verse 5, we see these sores as they burst open and scab over, open, and they crack and they ooze with pus. In Job chapter 7, verse 5, worms that form in those sores in his body. In Job 9, 18, he has difficulty breathing. Job 16, 16, there's a darkening of his eyelids. And Job 19, verse 17, he has a foul, foul breath. In Job 19, 20, and Job 33, 21, he has loss of weight. Job 30, verse 27, there's excruciating continual pain. In Job chapter 30, 30, high fever with chills and discoloring of the skin as well as anxiety and diarrhea. In Job 7, 3, in Job 29, verse 2, Job endured delirium, sleeplessness, and the rejection of his friends. If you can only imagine as those various chapters and each of those verses describe the incredible pain, the incredible situation that Satan has stricken his body with. All of this resulted in Job's being rejected. He's being isolated. He is re relocated out to the city dump. Outside the city, there was a place they burned garbage and rubbish and human excrement from the city. That became the place where Job would have to subsist and exist for a while. Warren Wiersbe says about this particular chapter, he says, and this situation where Job is now isolated uh, from people, there the city garbage was deposited and burned, and there the city's rejects lived, begging alms from whomever passed by. At the ash heap, dogs fought over something to eat, and the city's dung was brought and burned. The city's leading citizen, Job, was now living in abject poverty and shame. All that he humanly had left were his wife and his three friends, and even they turned against him. Can you only imagine tonight if suddenly... You were stricken in a condition like that. You didn't know why. You didn't have the Bible to understand what you and I can read about some 5,000 years or so later. Confusion, disbelief, isolationism, incredible unbearable pain, no hope that things would change, sitting in filthy surroundings, removed from the comforts of his home, Job found himself at ground zero in human form. Obviously, Job's wife, she too is overwhelmed. She obviously had had all that she could bear. And sitting beside him, she leans over and says, Do you still, do you still hold fast your integrity? I mean, after all, God had said to Satan, have you noticed? Have you considered my servant Job? He still holds fast his integrity. And now Job's wife calls into question Job's need. Do you still have a need to maintain your integrity any longer? And she tells Job to curse God and die. Now if you and I could have only seen the smile that no doubt came across the face of Satan's eyes as he and his minion stared glaringly, waiting, hoping that Job would just do what his wife said to do. You see, there was a plea for understanding. I know that there comes a day in all of our lives unless we are fortunate enough to be alive when Jesus comes again there will be an expiration date 
As I shared with the Sunday school class this morning, after Jesus, God himself came out of heaven's glory, robed in human flesh in the incarnation. He came here, he worked in his father's carpenter shop. He, the last three years of his life, he spent in public ministry telling people that he was God in human flesh. He would go to the cross, he would die for mankind's sins, but he would rise again on the third day. Then he would spend 40 days in post-resurrection appearances, and then on the Mount of Olives he would make his ascension back to heaven, set down at the right hand of the Father, where he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. His earthly work would be completed at that point. The purpose that he came, the plan for which he came. Each one of us here tonight have a plan and a purpose in life. But we also have an expiration date. At some point, we will either die in physical death or else we will be privileged to be raptured out of this world and into the presence of the Lord. When you look at Job's wife, there's a plea for understanding No doubt there's a plea for understanding on his part, but just put yourself in his wife's position for just a minute. To be fair to her, I suggest four reasons why she responded to Job in such a way and told him to curse God and die. Not that I in any way think that Job should have done that because I don't and he didn't. But we have to realize she too had lost all ten of her children. We too must understand the incredible pain of the grief that she was suffering and the despair that she was in. Who knows what anyone would do in that situation until you've lost the things that are most dear and precious to your life. I believe that Mrs. Job was so overcome, she was so overwhelmed with her grief that in her moment of desperation, she blurted out to him to just curse God and die. You see, she too had lost her future, her ten children. Secondly, I suggest that she blurted that out because she too had suffered the loss of great wealth and great possessions that she and Job had worked hard for all the days of their life. And as any wife whose husband has reached a high level of financial Security could testify to there are benefits, there are perks, there are pleasures that bring satisfaction with that type of a lifestyle. There are many possessions that were destroyed were her possessions as well. The servants, Job's stock out there that he had, uh, his great fame within the city, the respect of being who he was because no doubt people would look and judge him and assume that trouble had come his way because of something he had done himself. In that kind of the way, society looks upon things. Those were also her livestock. That was also her home that was destroyed. She was reduced to the same level as Job was economically and suddenly without any warning whatsoever. I suggest the third thing that she was so distraught and bewildered over that she blurted out those words to her husband because for years... She had enjoyed being the wife of the greatest of all the men of the East. Job chapter 1 verse 3. There was honor being Job's wife. There are also great public uh, moments and acknowledgments in inner joy that came from his successes and the way they were looked upon in society. She is no longer now the leading lady of her community. She's now the pathetic wife of a broken man 
whose whole world has collapsed before her. And now she sees her husband sitting alone there with her in abject poverty, covered with all of these incredible ulcerous sores. The Bible says from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. But I think there's a fourth reason that she blurted out to Job to curse God and die. Fourthly, she basically has lost her companion. She no longer has her beloved husband to enjoy in the quiet moments of life, in their give and take, moments of conversation, discussion, statements about their children and all that would have been happening in their lives. No doubt the romance and the love making is diminished in his present state. No hope that things would ever change. And I think that the best you and I can do as readers of this is cut some slack for Mrs. Job. After all, she too had suffered incredibly much during this time. Is it any wonder that she blurted out in a matter of moment? to curse God and let him take you home to be with him. She had reached her limit. Have you ever reached your limit? Have you ever gone, as the old song says, I've gone the last mile of the way? Let me tell you, no doubt, Job's wife had gone the last mile of her way. I'm not justifying her reason as much as I'm trying to understand her unanswered questions, her unanswered thoughts that perplexed and crowded her mind. Let me also add a few other things here to wives that I think is important. Number one, always guard your words when your husband is going through terribly hard times. Wives, this probably is a is a topic, a subject that should be on a Sunday morning. But I want you to know when men are going through incredibly, terribly hard times, the last thing they need to hear is their wife bring more heartache to them. Let me give you an always here before I give you the other part. Something you need to consider with men. When men go through sustained hard times, most of the times, much of the times, it weakens most men. For some reason, hardships seem to strengthen women. Ladies, I'm giving you a big plug tonight. Here's the Me Too moment. Ladies, let me tell you, there's something that when hardships come, it seems to strengthen women. Why on earth do you think God chose women to have children? If it had been left up to us, the world would have been extinct thousands of years ago. Let me tell you, I believe you are the stronger sex. That ought to be an amen. amen. I even heard what some men say amen there. Wow. Well, for some reason, women seem to be able to grab on during those times, but men are weakened when times of affliction hit and stay. In our weakened condition, oftentimes we lose our objectivity. Uh, we sometimes lose our stability. Our, discern, uh, our discernment is oftentimes skewed, and our determination is lagging. We become vulnerable and most of all, men don't know how to handle themselves when they are in a vulnerable state of mind. Women seem to do rather well with vulnerability. Men usually don't. And we become hard as it is to admit it. Men oftentimes remain fearful in silence. When men become afraid, strange things begin to happen. We don't understand ourselves. We entertain alien thoughts that we would never otherwise entertain. 
So in the light of all this, please hear me. We need your clear perspective, ladies. Men need your wisdom. They need your spiritual strength. Most of all, we need you to pray like you've never prayed before for your husband. We need not only your prayers, but we need your emotional support. We need you to take the initiative to step up. Men, oftentimes, their wife will be their best friend. There's something about ladies, they love to go to the bathroom together. They love to powder their faces together. They love to put on their lipstick. Men don't do that. Men don't go to the bathroom together. And so generally, men's best friend is their wife. And wives, if you are going to be supportive during times that men are struggling in their lives, you have to take the initiative and step up to the plate. They need your words of confidence and encouragement, and they need you then. You see, in the lonely hours of the man's greatest trial, nobody's words mean more to him than his wife's words. That's one of the God-given reasons you and your partner were called to be together. That's the always, okay, ladies? The always. Step up to the plate. Be the encourager. Don't be the downer. Now, let me give you the never. Never suggest that men compromise their integrity, even if it provided temporary relief. Never suggest that your husband compromise his integrity, even if it provided temporary relief, because words are powerful. And Job's wife's words spoke volumes to him when he was down and when he was out and when he was isolated, when he was ostracized from the city. And his friends will come and they no doubt, as we look at the chapters ahead, they will see him as if he is suffering all because of something he had done sinful. How many times through the years have I sat in hospital rooms? I've sat in funeral home offices with families. I've sat in nursing homes and I've heard story after story after story of people who said, what have I done that has created my situation? What have I done? The last thing that a spouse needs to hear are some discouraging words. Many times men undergo an intense time of testing and they sometimes begin an affair. I mean, think about it. You know, when people go through midlife crisis or whatever it is, sometimes men buy a sports car a convertible, they unbutton their shirt to their navel, and they wear a gold chain, and they get some real hip glasses or sunglasses. What am I trying to say, ladies? Many times you may not understand what the spouse is doing. While I'm certainly not justifying what happens here in this passage, I'm just saying sometimes when a man's at his lowest ebb, he will choose something that he normally would never have done before or chosen before. God had said to Satan, speaking of Job, he holds fast his integrity and she of all things... Ask him, why do you want to keep doing that? He needed her to say, Job, whatever you do, stand fast. I'll go with you wherever we need to go. I'll endure whatever we need to endure. But don't compromise your integrity. Let's just keep on walking with God even though we don't understand why all of this has taken place in our lives I want you to notice how Job responded. Notice the words that he speaks to his wife. 
in chapter 2, verse 10, he said, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. You see, in Job's most weakened condition, sitting in the misery of sores, he's lost all of his children. The laughter's gone from his home. All of his wealth has been taken away from him suddenly. Now his health is gone from him. And there in the misery pit filled with sores, not knowing if any of that would ever change, he stands firm and he looks at Mrs. Job and what does he do? He rebukes her. He reproves her. He says, in effect, I need to correct the course of this conversation. We're just not going there. That's basically what Job is doing. And then he asked this excellent question, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Every one of us here tonight love the goodness of God, amen? We say God is good all the time and all the time God is good and we know he is and we know that's true. But notice how Job reproved his wife. He said to her, Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Now, I don't know how many people there are in the world out there that know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior can lose their children, lose their future, and to be able to say what Job said. But I want you to think about that. How true is that in all of our lives, regardless of whether it's financial crisis, whether it's a marital situation, whether it's the, the loss of a child that you and they don't see eye to eye on and the child goes his or her way and you are estranged through the years, whether it's a situation going on at the workplace and you don't understand why things are the way they are, somebody got the promotion you thought you should have had and you didn't get, or I've lived for Jesus, I've given my best shot, and now my health is shot, and all of a sudden life caves in. It's not what it used to be. Job said, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Now Jesus told those disciples before he ever went back to heaven, he already said, in this world, you're going to have trials and tribulation. Jesus pre-warned them. Folks, let me tell you, people that come with the misnomer of thinking that when I receive Jesus, life is going to come up roses and daffodils, it's not. I tell you, a lot of people have more trouble then than they've ever had. You know why? Because Satan, his minions, they will attack you at every turn of the road. They will defeat you and discourage you and keep you hammered down. And Job looked at his wife. It's amazing. His incredible spiritual depth, his maturity, his wisdom. And he looks at her and says, basically, can we not accept the good things that God gives us, but we can't accept adversity? His insight certainly was rare. What incredible theology. How seldom would such a statement emerge in our secular society in which you and I live. Yet we would, rather we would hear responses such as, what kind of God is that who will treat you this unfairly after you have lived so devotedly? Or why in the world would you continue to stand fast? when this so-called loving God treats you like that. But I want you to listen. Job's counsel to her, shall we indeed accept good from God and not 
accept adversity. You see the difference? The difference in where Job was, spiritually speaking, and where she was. Job's maturity level was away up there on the scale. And she had obviously had all she could take. She obviously was not on that spiritual plane. Let me just say this. Down through the years in counseling people in grief and life loss, losses and situations, most people, husbands and wives, generally are not on the same page of grieving. They grieve differently. And oftentimes, more often than not, they are not able to help each other. And that's why when there have been the death of children, I think it's 80 to 90% of people that have lost children, generally they divorce. One reason for that, they don't know how to help each other. They don't know how to encourage the other mate. They're on different pages, different planes, different plateaus in their grieving. And so, consequently, the statistics are incredibly, incredibly high. Job says, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept? adversity. The Hebrew sentence reads it this way, the good shall we accept from God and the trouble shall we not accept? It's really a rhetorical question. It's not asked to be answered, but it's asked for the purpose of making the listener think through it. Job is thinking these thoughts Doesn't he have the right? Isn't he the potter? Aren't we the clay? Isn't he the shepherd? Aren't we the sheep? Isn't he the master? And we the servant? Isn't that the way it works? Robert Alden in his work on Job says it this way, this is a hard lesson for some believers to learn, especially if they feel they've been promised health and wealth or have misunderstood that God's wonderful plan for their lives involves only pleasantness and not trouble, believers on this side of the cross have many more examples from both the Bible and from church history of God's people who have suffered. Job was much more in the dark, yet out of that darkness, His strong belief in the sovereignty of God shone forth all the more brilliantly. Somehow, Job knew already that the clay doesn't ask the potter, what are you making? And so Job says, in effect, to Mrs. Job, no, 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 sweetheart, let's not do that. We serve a God who has the right to do whatever he does and he's never obligated to explain it or to ask our permission. Stop and consider, should we think that good things are all we receive? Is that the kind of God we serve? Let me tell you folks tonight, if you and I could understand all there is to understand about God, we wouldn't need God. If we knew all there was to understand, you and I would not need God. God knew that we did not have the capability. God created us as finite creatures. God did not give us the capacity to understand the things that are known only to him. If we're to survive, 
In all this confusion thrown at us, we must remember that the God we serve has a game plan. And that game plan is beyond our comprehension. And then to remember in verse 10, in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Trust. Trust. And faith. Job, in essence, was saying something like, Sweetheart, we can't explain any of this. So let's wait and let's watch and see how God works. We would never, ever dreamed in a lifetime what has happened would happen. Our hearts are broken. Our hearts are crushed. Our lives will never be the same again. We've lost everything. Well, not everything. We still have each other. Our God has a plan. And God's plan is unfolding even though we cannot understand it right now. I get amused at the televangelist preachers who preach a health and wealth gospel. If everybody were going to be healed, there'd be no hospitals. There'd be no nursing homes. There'd be no assisted livings. There'd be no funeral homes and no graveyards out there. If everybody was going to be touched and healed and be wealthy and prosperous, I just don't know how people can receive and believe all of that. Let me tell you, some of God's most valued people were people that suffered. They were people that lived from hand to mouth. And oftentimes, there are people that go and they hear those people speak and they go to healing services, and I know that God can speak the word and somebody be touched and healed. I'm certainly confident and aware of that. I'm also aware that he uses doctors and medicine. Otherwise, a lot of you wouldn't have taken the corona shot. I also know that people get sick, people grow old, and people die. It's a fact of life. Let me give you some conclusions tonight on these verses. When I began this second chapter study, I referred to a young man, I believe he was 16, Johnny Gunther. He was 16 years old, bright, intelligent, had everything going for him, and suddenly, and suddenly on a particular day, a particular moment, He was stricken with a brain tumor, and he would die. I close by giving you three timeless principles, I think, that are life applications from Job's experience so far. Number one, since our lives are full of trials, we need to remember there are a lot more that are coming. Since life is full of trials and tribulations, we need to keep in mind and remember that there's still more to come. Job later admitted in chapter 5, verse 7, for man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. I don't know why some of the health, wealth preachers out there don't get that verse down. For man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Let me tell you, trials are inevitable. Be aware that Satan's on the loose. He's on the prowl. Remember, no one is immune. No one is safe in this present life. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.12, Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Trials 
are the rule, they're not the exception. Go home tonight. Pull out your high school annual. And then look in the mirror. Has anything changed? Is anything rearranged? Has anything moved or dropped? A second principle tonight. Since we live in a fallen world, we need to understand that those who love us might just give us wrong advice. Job's wife, she was sincere. She honestly believed that what she was saying to Job was just go ahead and curse God and get it over with and, and let him just take you out of here. I mean, she thought that she was giving him great advice. Be careful what advice you listen to because we are in a fallen world. And good meaning people sometimes lead people in the wrong direction by giving wrong advice with loving tact. Job had to say to Mrs. Job, you speak as one of the foolish women. Job essentially saying, sweetheart, I love you, but I can't go there. Thirdly tonight and lastly, since our God is sovereign, in other words, he's in charge. He's in control. The world's out of control. The devil sing to that, but there is a God in heaven tonight. He rules in the kingdoms of men, and God is sovereign over all of his creation. He is the potter. We are clay. So we have to prepare ourselves for the good times as well as the times of adversity. Because he is God, the infinite God, he's unpredictable. You and I cannot predict what's going to happen. So, because God is sovereign, learn that life will be filled with blessings, but also learn that life will be filled with trials and adversity. Psalm 115.3, the psalmist said, our, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. God has no obligation to explain himself. God doesn't have to step into a hospital room and say, now let me give you five reasons why this happened to you. You and I, somewhere along the way, have to come to grips with the fact that God is filled with compassion. But his plans are beyond our comprehension. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 9. For my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so the best we can do with Job is say, oh God, I trust you. I don't understand. I don't know why this is happening in my life. If there's something I can learn, wonderful, if there's something that somebody else can learn, great. Just see me through it. Hold me close. Deepen me. Change me. Wrap your arming, loving army, arms around me. Job said, shall we accept good from God and not accept adversity somehow Job knew that God is God and that someday it would all be made plain to him 
That's one of the reasons that I believe that heaven's going to be such a delightful place when we step into the presence for the first time and we get that panoramic view and then and only then will we respond. So that's the reason. Now I see. Now I get it. You see, it's easier to lower your view of God than it is to raise your faith to such a height. We shall watch, one author says, the struggle as Job's faith is strained every way by temptations to see the cause of his misfortune in something less than God. Let me tell you, God is totally and completely and absolutely in charge tonight. Job, I believe, would exercise this. The Bible says that Job worshipped. I believe Job would say, and may his name be praised. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. Nevertheless, may his name be praised. That is worship at its highest level. God, I don't understand it. God, I'm confused. But somewhere in the midst of it, get me through this and give me strength to keep on trusting when I don't understand. Would you stand as we pray together tonight? Father, tonight as we come and sing this song of invitation, if there's someone here that needs to make a decision for you, oh God, I pray that you would look down from heaven. I pray that you would speak to their heart. Oh God, for the many people out there in life that have lost the most precious treasures of their life. Oh God, some way, somehow, somewhere, I pray you would manifest yourself in such a way maybe through a dream oh God that would bring incredible peace comfort hope encouragement to just to be able to hang on to hang on to faith and trust because if we don't have that, we don't have anything to hang on to. Father, thank you for this book. Challenging as it is to all of us, much we will not comprehend, but neither did those disciples. For three years they walked with you and they did not comprehend. But after resurrection, it was a different story. Oh God, one of these days after resurrection from these cemeteries when our precious loved ones are changed out of these earthly bodies and rejoin that part that we loved in the heavens, then and only then will we either truly understand it or it will not matter anymore then. Oh God, keep our faith intact. Keep us strong. Keep us persevering. Oh God, I pray for the many tonight that are struggling with so many questions. Oh God, comfort their hearts some way, somehow in your manifestation to them to let them know that on heaven's shore all is well all is alive and all is safe forevermore Father if there's someone tonight that needs to come may they come in these quiet moments I pray in Jesus name Amen